This is the lecture for Friday, 21st of May, 2021, for European history. Now should we out, and we are ready to go. Where we left things, the Russians were moving into Berlin. And it was street to street fighting as intense as anything that happened at Stalingrad. Can you shut the fan off, please? Thank you. Hitler's one hope is to convince somehow or wait for a miracle to happen somehow that would allow him to survive by breaking up the alliance between the Anglo-Saxons, the British and the Americans, and the Russians, between the free societies and the communists against him. Hitler's hero was the Prussian king, Frederick the Great, who at one time seemed to be really facing an un- uh, an inextricable defeat, a defeat from which he could not extricate himself. And then, I believe it was Catherine the Great, or the Russian Tsar, whoever it was that was leading Russia at the time of that war, this is the Seven Years' War, uh, dies. And it throws the alliance against him into chaos, and Frederick ultimately wins. When President Franklin Roosevelt dies in April of 1945, Hitler celebrates because he believes that this is the sign that he is going to triumph, that without Roosevelt, the alliance between communism and freedom against fascism will split. All he has to do is hold out. But Hitler is delusional. Why? Something I did not mention about late 1944. In July, which is about a month and a half after the D-Day landings in the West, when allies are closing in on Germany on from both sides, one of the several assassination attempts against Hitler that was perpetrated over the years comes very close to fruition. <laughs> this is Operation Valkyrie. The Roman Catholic Church under Pope Pius XII had been organizing anti-Nazi cells in Germany for a long time. These anti-Nazi cells were of Catholics and friends who saw National Socialism as a satanic form of government that Christians should not and did not owe allegiance to. Now, Pius XII did not come out publicly about this because fascist Italian and then later Nazi troops were right outside Vatican City. Pius did save most of Rome's Jews by getting them out before the Germans came, or by keeping them underground when the Germans were there. The church did work against the Nazis. There were a bunch of people who try to argue that Pius XII and the Roman Catholic Church were collaborators because they didn't make some kind of symbolic gesture against fascism. No, they didn't. Instead, they worked behind the scenes to undermine it, to assassinate Hitler and overthrow his government and to smuggle people out. The army had been trying to overthrow, uh, conservative elements within the army had been trying to overthrow Hitler since the 1930s. But each time the appeasement powers gave in to Hitler, their efforts were undermined. There was an assassination attempt on Hitler uh, when he was uh, celebrating the Beer Hall Pooch anniversary um, between, I think it was in 40 or 41. But a bomb went off in a pillar right behind his podium uh, after he left, he his schedule. Hitler always kept people waiting, but this time he didn't. He was actually early, and he spoke quickly, and then left, and then boom, and uh, he was not killed. Well, in July of forty-four, a plot of uh, army officers, associated by this Catholic group, and some navy officers as well, come up with a plot to go to Hitler's headquarters at the Wolf's Lair in East Prussia and detonate a bomb during a staff conference. 
Hitler had daily conferences with his generals to track the course of the war. So Colonel Count von Stauffenberg, a man who had lost an eye and an arm uh, in the fighting, uh, basically a German war hero, was also a staff officer and he had access to these meetings. So a system was set up by which the army would declare martial law after it was announced that Hitler had been assassinated. Stauffenberg brought a suitcase bomb with him to the Wolf's Lair. He got it past the uh, guards. Again, war hero, military officer, part of Hitler's conference group. He managed to activate the bomb by turning some knobs on <coughs> his um, briefcase. But unlike a Japanese suicide bomber or Islamist suicide bomber today, Stauffenberg intended to kill Hitler and live. So imagine that this is all a table here. And Stauffenberg <coughs> is standing here. Actually, I'll do it here because of the visual on my camera. So we got a table here, here, here. Hitler is right over there, right between you two. And uh, this is one big table. And Stauffenberg places his briefcase here. So that when it blows, it's going to blow right at Hitler and the people around him. He leaves it there. He has to go get a phone call. That's his excuse. He leaves and gets out of the wolf's lair uh, before he can be stopped. Brasses his way through the guards. The problem is, this is a big, heavy conference table. And a guard, uh, another officer, steps up and his feet are blocked by the briefcase. So the other officer takes the briefcase and puts it on the other side of the table leg. Big, thick table leg. Now explosions follow the path of least resistance. When the bomb detonates, instead of it blowing right at Hitler, the primary explosion is deflected off in this direction. A number of people die, a number of people are injured, including Hitler, but Hitler survives. He is never the same. Hitler was a vegetarian anti-smoker who had trouble anyway with his nerves. But after the bomb in July of 44, he had a perpetual tremor to one of his hands. The other hand had it too. Uh, he walked with a shuffle uh, and he was even more easily... I mean, this is a man who used temper tantrums as a means of controlling people. Bismarck did the same thing. Um, but what Hitler does <clears throat> before July is he may seem to blow up, but he's not really. He's using it as a tactic, as a technique. After July of 44, he really does just get lost in his rage. A series of show trials based on the purge trials set in Russia during Stalin's purges of the 30s happens. Hitler enjoys his home movies for the next few months. The <coughs> enemies from this plot being hanged from meat hooks in butcheries by piano wire. Not hanged in such a way as to break the neck quickly and kill mercifully but hanged in such a way that these people are strangling to death as the piano wire is cutting through their neck. And Hitler laughs and applauds and enjoys this because he feels a need to personally revenge himself. Stauffenberg is shot that evening. When Hitler is announced assassinated, the army forces begin to move. But when it's announced that Hitler survived the attack and he personally goes on the radio, and speaks, and people recognize his voice, the plot collapses. Stauffenberg is arrested, and he, along with the others uh, who are with him, are taken out and shot right away, which is lucky for Stauffenberg. Had he lived, he would have been tortured slowly to death. Stauffenberg's last words are, long live holy German, which is an expression of his particip participation in the Roman Catholic uh, anti-Hitler plot. Stauffenberg was a devout Catholic. 
and was motivated by religion as much as anything else to try to end Hitler's regime. So, in the movie Downfall, there is a famous scene, which if we have time I may show you later, or I may attach to the, to the Google stream, where Hitler loses it. And this is, ha this is something that actually happened. This isn't the way Hitler usually was. But he's sitting in the bunker, Roosevelt's died, he's waiting for the alliance to fall apart, it's not falling apart. His fat wrote, um, colleague Goering basically says, I'll take over because Hitler's stuck in Berlin. So Hitler feels betrayed by Goering, he arrests Goering, <clears throat> who's in another part of Germany. And Hitler is moving around mythical army units on a map to try to fight the Battle of Berlin. But these army units don't exist anymore. And when he is told that a relief column under General Steiner cannot make it to Berlin because it's not composed of the troops Hitler thought it was, he completely loses it in a frothing, shouting rage in front of all of his generals and within earshot of everyone in the bunker, he just goes hysterical out of control. And it's shocking because it's the only time, I mean, they, they had seen him use theatrics, but this was, this was for real. And it's at this moment, probably, that Hitler realizes that the war is lost. So, he has a birthday party. He then marries his mistress, Eva Braun, who has been with him for, let's see, 45, about 15 years, almost. And then after uh, their birthday part, their wedding uh, ceremony, he goes into his private quarters with Ava. She takes poison and he takes his Walther sidearm, puts it in his mouth and presses the trigger. His body and Ava's body are then taken up stairs and they are doused with gasoline and they are burned to a crisp. He's identified by dental records. Um, Goebbels, his propaganda minister, the poisonous dwarf, and his wife poison their little children. They have, I think, five little girls. They do it themselves and then they poison themselves. Their bodies are taken out, but there isn't enough gasoline to properly immolate them. So there are these gruesome half-burned figures. Um, so Hitler dies. He places the leader of the German Navy in charge, who then surrenders the empire. And Nazi Germany is over. May 8th, 1945 is VE Day when the Russians, I'm sorry, when the Germans surrender to the British, the Americans, and the Russians. The war in Europe is over. Now we shift back to the Pacific. In the Pacific Theater of Operations, or PTO, as opposed to ETO, the European Theater of Operations, the attacks are going to come from 1943. <clears throat> The British counterattack in India into Burma. MacArthur's forces from Australia fight their way northward through Papua New Guinea and into the island groups south of the Philippines. The U.S. Navy begins moving west of Hawaii and taking uh, islands in the Marshalls and the Gilberts and the Marianas. So attacks are coming from the west, from the south, and from the east. And the war continues in China. Russia is not a part of it. These battles are conducted with a combination of aircraft carrier task forces and United States Marine Corps amphibious landings. Up until now, warships have used mine tactics. 
You've got lines of warships shooting at one another. This is the way it was at Jutland in World War I, Trafalgar under Nelson, and all the way back almost to the Spanish Armada. But an aircraft carrier task force is different. You've got your carrier, or two, or three, and they're surrounded by battleships, cruisers, and destroyers, and they're covered by a combat air patrol of fighters. The purpose of this roundel formation is to confusticate enemy air attack and submarine attack. The destroyers are protecting against aircraft and submarines. When aircraft come in, they come under fire from destroyer and the aircraft guns and the fighters protecting the carriers. When, if they penetrate the destroyer screen, the enemy uh, planes are going to get hit by massive anti-aircraft fire from battleships and cruisers that form the inner ring. The carriers themselves in World War II also have anti-aircraft guns. So an enemy is going to be withered by concentric rings of defensive fire, plus, again, the fighter defenses. All of this is designed to protect the carriers, whose job isn't to fight enemy warships, but launch and receive and replenish aircraft. The carriers are mobile airfields that control the sea space around them for many hundreds of miles. And it's under this air cover that most of the invasions happen. An amphibious invasion by the U.S. Marine Corps involves a beach defended by the Japanese. You have aircraft carrier planes bombing the island. You have battleships and cruisers off the coast blasting at the island. And then you have marine landing ships disgorge troop carrying boats. And these boats go to the beach and discharge their marines, who then march inland. Amphibious operations can be a bloody mess. And every time we do it, either at the beaches or inland, we take heavy casualties. No matter how much we blast the enemy island with bombs or gun shells from battleships and cruisers, the enemy can always dig a deeper hole. And it takes American foot soldiers, Marines and Army soldiers, to go into each hole and either kill every Japanese there or fight through and uh, secure the entire tunnel. This island hopping warfare is truly designed to kill as many Americans as possible so that we'll go away. That is, remember, the Japanese theme. But we press on. Our aircraft carrier task forces, our marine landing forces, move steadily closer towards Japan. In 1944, autumn of, MacArthur's forces and the Navy forces arrive in the Philippines. At the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the largest Navy battle in human history, over a three-day period, there are battleship actions, aircraft carrier attacks, uh, destroyer actions, submarine attack, invasions by sea, amphibious invasions, um, land battles in the jungle, and kamikaze attacks. The last battleship on battleship fights happens as part of the Battle of Leyte Gulf. MacArthur lands with the President of the Philippines, President Osmena, and MacArthur famously uh, says to the Filipino people, I have returned. Rise up, and in the name of your beloved ancestors, fight. In the name of your God, fight. Now is the time to stand up and fight the invader. And the Philippines do rise up. But there are going to be massive battles, especially around the city of Manila, the capital in the northern Philippines. Meanwhile, in the central Pacific, on the island of Saipan in the Marianas, you have the kind of intense bloody fighting I've told you about, 
but they are also the first Japanese civilians that we encounter in large numbers. At Saipan, not only do the Japanese soldiers and sailors and Marines fight and die almost to the last man, but we have newsreel footage of mothers holding their children in their arms by the hand, in line, stepping off a 200-foot cliff over the sea, jumping to prevent themselves and their children from being captured by the Gaijin, the round-eyed barbarians. At Saipan, as at all of these islands, the Japanese prove that they are willing to die, eager to die, while killing Americans, or at least rather than fall into American hands. This is not a European enemy we're facing. This is not an enemy steeped in the value of human life that Christian Western civilization has inculcated in us. This is an enemy that is dedicated to victory or death for the God Emperor, and that victory or death is now, since they're losing the war, ending up in death more than anything else. As we get closer to Japan, the battles get more intense, not less. Iwo Jima is a volcanic island. Okay, I'll explain. We took Saipan because it's within bomber range of the Japanese home islands. From Saipan and an island nearby called Tinian, the American bombing campaign against Japan can begin full time. About halfway between Saipan and Japan, from the south, is the island of Iwo Jima in the Volcano Islands, and it is a volcanic island. At Iwo Jima, the... Um, Marines face combat on the water, on the beach. They almost don't get off the beach. When they finally get off the beach, they fight inland. They take the island. Then the Japanese come up from holes in the ground, and the fight goes on and on and on. We need Iwo Jima as a fighter base so that our long-range fighters can escort our bombers over the Japanese mainland. But it is a bloody mess. Worse than anything on Saipan. The only battle worse than Iwo Jima after it's won. And Iwo Jima has the famous painting of the Marines raising the flag over Mount Suribachi. The only battle worse than that is the Battle of Okinawa. <coughs> Okinawa is actually considered part of Japan. It's on the outer ring of islands between Taiwan and Kyushu. It is the largest of the Ryukyu island chain, but it's been part of Japan for, for a very long time. The Okinawans are a distinct ethnic group from the Japanese, but part of Japan. Okinawa is large for an island. The enemy doesn't face us on the beaches, not like Iwo Jima. The enemy waits for us to go inland, and then hits us, and hits us, and hits us. More and more, the Japanese defenders are engaged not in fighting a real battle, but in a form of suicide, where if they can kill anyone while they die, they'll eagerly die right here, right now. The closer we get to Japan, the more fanatical the defenses become. The Japanese Navy and Air Force descends into what is called the Kamikaze. They're first seen at the Battle of Leyte Gulf in 44, and they're seen increasingly in 45. Kamikaze is Japanese for divine wind. Remember, in the 1200s, Kublai Khan's Mongol Empire invaded Japan twice. In both cases, typhoon winds sink the Mongol invasion fleets. Japan is saved from a, an otherwise invincible conqueror by the gods themselves. The gods themselves manifest as these divine winds. Well, who are the divine winds going to personify as today? 
the Japanese asked themselves. Willing young men who learn how to take off and fly a plane but don't care much about landing. Willing young men who understand that they are fulfilling their purpose to defend and protect the God Emperor. Who the night before their mission clip off their fingernails and toenails, put them in a box, a sandalwood box, which is going to be sent home to their families. It is the only remains they will have to treasure. They write their death poem the next morning. They read their death poem. They toast the god emperor in sake, which is Japanese rice wine. They put their bandana on, which has their death poem on it. They get into their planes, many of which are old, filled to the gills with fuel and explosives. They take up and form formations which are called kikusui, flying chrysanthemums. The chrysanthemum is the symbol of the god emperor. These kikusui, these flying chrysanthemums, go out past the coast of Japan to where the American fleet has been identified. And they dive to their deaths. Ideally, hitting a battleship, an aircraft carrier, a cruiser, a tanker, spending their lives. Now, American air defenses are very good at this point, but they are designed against planes trying to dive bomb, strafe, and torpedo bomb, and then pull away. A suicide bomber doesn't behave like a normal aircraft. They get very high and then they dive straight down, presenting minimal aspect to the, tar to the ship they're hitting. That means they're heading towards it. Very little of it is, in, uh, is facing the, the targeted ship. You can shoot and shoot and shoot. But if you don't get the suicide bomb uh, plane far enough away, or if you don't explode it with enough force, even if you kill the pilot, even if you break the plane into three or four pieces, they're all going to hit your ship. The fuel, the explosions are still going to damage your ship. More American ships are damaged and sunk. More American sailors are killed by kamikazes than anything in the history of the United States Navy. Each of these suicide planes is a human targeted missile. But it's not just aircraft. The Japanese developed manned rockets with bigger warheads. They're dropped from a distant bomber, ignite the rocket. They're called baka bombs because bakayaru means crazy or foolish. The kaitane are manned torpedoes. Midget submarine sized torpedoes with massive warheads where a kamikaze pilot gets into the kaitane and targets the, moves his uh, manned torpedo close enough to the enemy ship, and then when he's close enough and when he's sure he's going to hit, ignites the engines. These are only a few examples of the suicide tactics, the kamikaze tactics used as we get closer and closer to Japan. In the summer of 1945, we are in this intensifying battle with the Japanese nation, not just its military. Operation Olympic, which my mother and father-in-law were going to be a part of, was the landing on the southernmost home island of Kyushu, where Nagasaki is, the only Christian city or Christianized city in Japan. Operation Downfall was going to take place the next year. Operation Varsity and Downfall, which were the landings on Honshu, the biggest of the Japanese islands. The estimates were that the Japanese people would be used as cannon fodder by their military to swamp our guys, to force our men to kill women and children who were walking towards them or running towards them with bombs strapped to them, to break the spirit of the Americans who consider themselves to be decent people. The estimates were that we would lose, in the invasion of the Japanese home islands, one million dead, several million wounded and missing. 
one million dead is a far greater this is a casualty uh, estimate than we have ever had anywhere in the war. One million dead. The war is expected to go on and on and on until Admiral Halsey's prediction that after the war is done, the only place the Japanese language will be spoken will be in hell might come true, literally. Even on Okinawa, where there are a lot of civilians, the number of people who surrender fairly small. The number of Japanese who surrender very small. This looks like the end of the Japanese nation. And the leadership know it. The emperor knows it. The general staff knows it. But there's no alternative. We can't surrender. We can't risk the God Emperor. And the Allied policy for years against all the Axis powers has been the unconditional surrender of the Axis powers. At this moment, President Truman Roosevelt's successor, is informed of a successful test of a new type of weapon, an implosion-explosion device colloquially called an atomic bomb at Alamogordo, New Mexico. Now, when they test this bomb, the fruit of years of intense research, labor, and secrecy, to the point where we get illiterate janitorial staff because they can't read and understand the notes that the scientists are making. The Manhattan Project takes the scientists, the physicists of Europe that escaped the Nazis, of Britain and the United States, and work together to produce this new type of weapon in a moment. Enrico Fermi, the world-famous Italian physicist is involved in building the first atomic pile under the basketball court at the University of Chicago. This project is organized by General Leslie Groves, who built the Pentagon, the largest office building in the world. And it's headed up by the scientist J. Robert Oppenheimer, who is an American physicist whose physics is good, but his real skill is in getting eccentric scientists to work together. Between them, Grove and Oppenheimer bring the Manhattan Project to fruition, but there is a small chance at Alamogordo that the bomb will ignite the atmosphere. There is a more than mathematical possibility that the oxygen in the air will be heated to such an extent that a chain reaction will occur that will burn the entire atmosphere of the planet. But the scientists don't think it's likely, so we take the chance. An atomic fireball and a mushroom cloud first appear over New Mexico uh, in uh, mid-1945. Uh, did you know that the majority of the Manhattan Project in its early stages and most of the experimenting in the uranium and all of the resources came from southern Idaho and the Nuclear Institute? I did not. I knew that uh, Hanford facility over in Washington was involved in uh, setting up centrifuges that can produce uh, weaponization, weaponizable fuel. I did not know that Southern Idaho was so involved. Cool. Uh, do you know where it was? Was it Boise or somewhere it in the Snake River? farther Valley? down, kind of like in the desert region of okay. Idaho. Uh, and I'm pretty sure there is also a nuclear waste uh, center of down there as well. That's just like in the middle of the plains. That's just like a hill. It's just like a steel door. Yeah. Well, hopefully they're deep underground, sealed yeah. away from the water table. That's yeah. some scary stuff. Yeah. The bomb, when it explodes, it's a nighttime explosion, is observed by Oppenheimer through dark leaden glasses. And his first words afterwards are a quote from the Bhagavad Gita, the Hindu scriptures. As he looks up at this new force, he quotes, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. 
this weapon could end the war. President Truman is with Stalin and Churchill at Potsdam, south of Berlin. He's informed. Truman tries telling Stalin the secret. Stalin basically doesn't react. He almost says, I know. Because the American, uh, or because the Manhattan Project is deeply influ infiltrated by communist agents. The Rosenbergs, Julius and Ethel, and Klaus Fuchs, among others, um, betray America's atomic secrets to the Soviets so that barely four years later, they produce their own atomic bomb. If an atomic bomb were to be dropped on the resort, a crater would extend out to, well, maybe um, the area of north, uh, at the uh, northern edge of North Idaho College campus. The blast radius would extend at least to here, maybe up to um, the Walmart and Hayden. Radiation in the form of atomic dust called fallout would be falling from the sky hundreds of miles downrange, depending upon the way the wind is blowing. What to do? Well, the idealists uh, in the Truman administration, and there were several, said, well, what we should do is invite the Japanese to a demonstration off their coast and blow up an unpopulated island. But the problem is not the Japanese politicians, but the Japanese military who are willing to fight on and on and on. Also, there are the Russians to consider. The Russians are making more and more trouble as the uh, war ends. And it becomes clear that we're going to be involved in a global struggle with them for survival and supremacy. No. We've got to use the weapon for real. In the strategic plan for bombing Japan, there were a few cities that were left relatively unhit. So that if we had a new weapon, we could test its effects in an almost clinical way without having the effects of the other bombings. The Annapolis of Japan, where their Naval Academy is, is the city of Hiroshima. The Christian city or Christianized city in Japan is Nagasaki. On 5th August 1945, an American B-29 Super Fortress bomber, the Enola Gay, takes off from Tinian Island under the command of Colonel Paul Tibbetts. It flies with a single other B-29 that's going to film it. This unit that Tibbetts is commanding has been training to drop a super heavy bomb for months in secret. He arrives over Hiroshima, drops the bomb, turns away at maximum speed. The uh, photo plane gets all of this on camera. And above the city of Hiroshima, I think at about uh, a couple thousand feet, uh, the bomb explodes. Because that way it, it pancakes the ground under it. Those uh, very close to the explosion are disintegrated. No sign. Buildings flattened. People at a certain distance leave what are called Hiroshima shadows. Basically, on brick walls and bits of uh, walls that aren't destroyed, you see like the shadows of people in various poses. These are a bit like the people of Pompeii that were trapped in the ash. But there's no body. What simply is, is they're close enough to be disintegrated, but far enough away so that their bodies actually prevent the walls right behind them from getting flash effects of the bomb. So what you see are the shadows of people as they're being disintegrated. The city center is destroyed, the suburbs heavily damaged. The Japanese army says it's a lie that it was a single plane, it was clearly a firebombing attack. What is a firebombing attack? Well, I told you last time that incendiaries were going to be used. Those are firebombs. In Dresden, Germany, 
we conduct an experiment. We've used firebombs on other German cities, but in Dresden we're going to do something particular. What we're going to do is have the British come in night one, drop flares and bombs indicating the center of the city of Dresden. Then an unending bomber stream for the rest of the night is going to drop firebombs, incendiary bombs, napalm bombs, white uh, phosphorus bombs on that city center target. Keep bombing the firestorm. By day, American bomber formations will do the same thing. Second night, keep bombing the firestorm. Second day, keep bombing the firestorm by American bombers. Third night, it ends. What we create in Dresden is called a firestorm. It is a fire so hot that tornadic winds erupt at ground level, literally sucking people out of basements miles away across the countryside into the conflagration. People in bomb-proof shelters under the city of Dresden are roasted alive. Some are turned to ash. More people are killed in the firebombing of Dresden than are killed in either a bombing attack, uh, atom bomb attack. Kurt Vonnegut, the writer, is in a prison, uh, a German POW camp in a slaughterhouse outside of the city of Dresden, and he experiences it secondhand, writes the book Slaughterhouse Five. I do not agree with Vonnegut at all, but he's an eyewitness. And his reaction is extremely sharp. And if you're interested in reading a deeply emotional anti-war book, read Slaughterhouse Five. We do the same thing to Tokyo. Trying to avoid the Imperial Palace, we turn the rest of the city into a series of firestorms. Far more people are killed in the firebombing of Tokyo than in either atom bomb attack. You don't need atomic bombs to destroy population. You just need fire bombs, lots of them, and the willingness to use them, which we were willing to do in 1945. But Hiroshima is destroyed by one plane, one bomb. The army denies it. Japan, Japan doesn't surrender. President Truman predicts that unless Japan does surrender, a reign of ruin from the air, the likes of which the earth has never seen, will continue to hit Japan. A few days later, another B-29 drops the plutonium bomb, little um, fat man, over the city of Nagasaki, and it is destroyed in atomic fire. At this point, the emperor calls a conference, and he lets it be known that he is surrendering. The Empire. He's going to record a surrender message. The generals agree. They're horrified, but they agree. They're horrified for the nation. They agree. Several of them kill themselves rather than agree. That afternoon, Hirohito records a surrender message to the Japanese people. That night, the same type of young army officer that started all of this in Manchuria in 1941 uh, a collection of these young patriotic officers invades the headquarters of NHK, the Japanese radio network. They kill the manager of the station. They brutalize the employees. They want the emperor's recording. If they stop the emperor's recording from being broadcast, they calculate, the emperor will come to his senses and we will continue to fight on and sooner or later we'll kill enough Americans and they'll go away. Their efforts are broken up by the last B-29 attack of the war. The next day, the Emperor's message is read. For the first time in their lives, the Japanese people hear the voice of their God Emperor, saying, we must endure the unendurable. Japan surrenders. V J Day is August 15, 1945. On the battleship USS Missouri, representatives of the emperor 
and the imperial government signed the Articles of Surrender. By this point, American troops are already landing in Japan, and the Japanese are cooper largely cooperating with them. Now, there are people who live after the fact who whinge and hem and haw and say how horrible we were being the only people on Earth to atomic use atom bombs on human beings. To which I say, easy for you to say. Number one, your lives are not on the line. My in-laws were. They were saved by the atom bomb, as were those million-plus casualties that we would have faced. Number two, nothing in the history of Japan has saved more Japanese lives than those bombs. What we saw in Hiroshima and Iwo Jima and Okinawa, what the Japanese army was planning, was the slow suicide of the Japanese people killing Americans, British, Russians, anyone else who invaded their land. They would rather die as a people than let the emperor down. Now, it's true that there were some civilian populations that were looking for terms of surrender. But given that the young army officers tried to undermine the emperor and his orders, there is no question in my mind that those civilian populations had, or politicians had zero chance, none, of actually effecting a peace with the United States without getting assassinated by their own army. The atom bombs were not the worst attacks in World War II. Those were the fire bombings of Dresden and Tokyo. And any American president, and this is something Truman said later, that didn't use every weapon at their disposal to end the war quickly and save lives would have been rightly impeached and damned by history as somebody who caused the needless death of countless Americans and Japanese. It was the shock effect of the atom bombs that did it. The firebombing of Tokyo and firebombing of other cities did not stop the army from its plans. It was the fact that with a single bomb, a city could be destroyed that shocked the emperor into surrendering, and the emperor is the one who made the peace possible. Yes. Well, he does. Colonel Tibbetts did. Yeah. Colonel Tibbetts was absolutely for it. Um, I. I really wonder if a lot of the people who have qualms about this who weren't there would feel the same way if they or their loved ones were going to go into the meat grinder that was Japan. And I really wonder if they think about the cost of Japanese lives of an invasion. Anyway, have a good weekend. No history assignment.